Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. In this last lecture of week three, I'm going to be quickly going through some Excel examples of internal standards and standard editions. This Excel sheet will be made available to you, and if you have open source Excel available free on the web, you should be able to look over my equations and setup. But realize that there's a lot that goes on in setting up an Excel sheet, and that if I went through every detail very slowly, this would be a very long recording. So I'm just going to try to sit, hit some highlights of how I derive my um, Excel sheets, and so hopefully you can create your own. So this is the first problem I wanted to do. It's a pretty standard problem in that you're taking a calibration data set where you're increasing the amount of lead, you're measuring an increase in the AES signal, and you've included an internal standard of constant concentration at each data point, which of course leads to um, a way to sort of correct for fluctuations that may be present in the instrument. But if you look at the questions, the first several are really just about handling the data set without the internal standard. So for the first set, we're actually going to just focus on the lead and the AES signal. So to get the slope of this data, we just take type in equal slope, our x values and our y values. To get the intercept, we use the Excel intercept function. R squared, we haven't talked a lot about it, but it's nice to have. The closer you get to 1, the more linear your data is, the better the fit, although STEYX statistics a little bit better for us in that sense, but R squared is a pretty standard thing to look at. And as you can see, this is still a pretty good data set even in the absence of an internal standard. So the next thing I've been asked to do is to do a scatter plot. So you're going to highlight your X and Y. You make a little box. You come over to scatter, hit scatter. There you have it. The main thing I wanted to show you here is how to make a trend line. So if you go and right click on a data set, you can go to add trend line. You see it's linear. And what I really like is you can display the equation on the chart and display the R squared value. And so if you didn't want to type in these expressions, you could just make a chart. And if you want to put in some nice axis, you just go to layout and pick things like axis title, chart title, and you can clean this up. Usually I delete these over here to the right. Okay, so there's our linear curve, and you'll see it's pretty good, but this data point's a little high, and that one's a little low, but it's still a very, very good regression. So right now we've done these two things, so let's think about moving along to this one. Calculate the lead in an unknown with 234 and that. So we'll start with that signal. So to calculate the unknown, it's going to be the signal that we measure in the unknown, subtracting from that our intercept, and then dividing that by our instrument response function. And so we get a 4.68 error. So that's pretty good. All right, let's worry about calculating our error. I'm going to do this pretty quickly because I did this in the last one, but you can follow along. I'm going to calculate the statistic, the standard error of the estimate. And that's just going to be STEYX, and it's my X values, and then my, sorry, my Y values, and then my X values. There we have it. My SX X statistic is going to be the standard deviation of all of my x values in my calibration. I'm going to square that and then I'm going to multiply it by n minus 1, which in this case is 6. So then there's this third term in the SXO formula, which is a bit of a, of a bear, and it's going to be equal to the actual signal that I care about, we'll say 234 in this case, minus the average of the y values, and then the difference between all of that squared, and then we're going to divide it by the slope squared multiplied by SXX. And we finish it out with one more parenthesis. And we get an SX third term. Now we put it all together to get SX0, and that's going to be equal to SYX divided by the slope times 1 plus 1 over n, which in this case is 7, plus the third term. And then that quantity is to the square root. And we get 2.214. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, type in my error here. And so for one replicate measurement, that's why we went 1, it's just 2.21. If we want to go to 5, we just come over here and instead of 1, going to be 1 over 5. 
and we get 1.31. So our 4.68 ppm has a whole lot of error associated with it, especially if we only take one replicate. And that's really driven by the fact that we have a pretty um, a decent but not perfect uh, regression. The other problem is we're measuring a relatively small number. If we go up to 1200, which is what I actually asked you to calculate, you're going to see that you get a smaller regression. And I'm going to go ahead So what that example reveals is that when you're measuring really, really small values, you're going to have a bigger problem with your regression, meaning you're going to get error, and that error is somewhat fixed across the range. So in those low values, you're going to get 20 or 30 percent. But up here, you can see it's more like 10 percent. Now, if you wanted to turn these into actual error bars, remember, you're going to just multiply it by t. And the t value for this particular case, we have, a deg we have um, five degrees of freedom because you always look up the number that you took, minus 2 in this case, and that's going to be 2.571. And remember, those degrees of freedom are given by this, which is the number of calibrations, times the replicate error there. And you're going to get 5.5 times 10, 5.5 ppm. Okay, let's do the internal standard, because that's really the new part of this. So what we're going to do in the internal standard is we're going to actually take this initial data set and we're going to turn it into ratios. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ratio our lead concentrations by 70, because that was the given value for our internal standard. And we're also going to ratio the signals. There's the signal of the lead divided by the signal of the internal standard. Now, the internal standard stays constant-ish over this whole range, which is exactly what we would have expected. So we have to get the slope here. So what we're doing is we're really calibrating the ratios of the signal and the concentration to the internal standard signal and concentration. So we just have new types of x's and new types of y's, but otherwise, conceptually, it's the same. OK, those will be useful for finding it. And the given signal that I've been given is 1,200. But remember, it was 1,200 divided by 2945 because that was the, so the ratio that I'm handling here is 0.407. And this is actually what we're trying to calculate. OK, so for my SYX statistic, STEYX of all of my Ys. My SXX is just the standard deviation here, quantity squared times 6, which is n minus 1. The third term in the SXO formula is always kind of interesting. It's going to be the ratio signal minus the average of the ratio signal. That whole thing squared divided by my slope squared times my SXX statistic. And then to get SX, my entire thing, remember it's this divided by the slope. That usually ends up being the bulk of the number. And then it's 1 plus 1 over n, which in this case is 7, plus my third term, whole quantity raised to the 0.5 power. That's my ratio error. And then to get my ppm error, whenever I have that ratio, I multiply by 70. And that's my ppm error. So also, just to reiterate, how do we get the unknown concentration? Well, we're not going to get the unknown concentration. We're going to get the unknown ratio. So we're going to take this given signal ratio. We're going to subtract from it the intercept that we got for this new calibration. We're going to divide by the slope. And that is the unknown ratio. And then if we multiply that by 7, 70, we're going to get back to 28 ppm, which is pretty close from what we calculated. If we come up here, we calculated 28. Here we calculated about the same. So the error that we got using the internal standards is 1.22, which beats the error that we got up here. OK, so I have some raw data for example two for you to look at. This is just another example. Again, this takes a fair bit of practice. As you can see, I did the data analysis without internal standards shown right here. So what I'm going to do is very quickly, very quickly, go do the internal standards analysis for you. OK, so in this data set, what's interesting is that you actually have quite uh, a bad 
calibration curve. If you come over here, I mean, that's barely a decent calibration curve. So we're really hoping that our internal standard, which in this case is gold, is going to clean up our copper analysis. So what we're going to do, like before, is we're going to create and do our x value as a ratio of the copper to the gold. So we know that we always have 2.3, so it's just going to be this number divided by 2.3, where we're doing everything in weight percent. And so this is just called the ratio x. And this is the ratio of the signals. And that's going to be given by the mass spec height, mass spec peak height, divided by whatever we measured on the gold. See if we can clean that up. So this is actually going to be what we're going to Okay, so now we're at the stage where we have to figure out how are we going to handle the, um, the signal that we get. So up here we're having 58.9, but now we know we had 49.4. So we had a 49.4 here, and we got a 58.90 here. So there you have it, and this is what we're trying to calculate. And finally, we're ready to put it all together. So an important point here is that this is the error in the ratio. And to get the error in the concentration of copper, we're going to have to actually multiply this number times the 2.3 weight percent that's present in gold. Since we're doing everything in weight percent, I'm going to just go ahead and multiply by 2.3. And we end up with 0 0.007, which is, sounds like it's about right. And that's going to be the error in the weight percent of the copper. Now to calculate the weight percent copper error, it's very similar. We just have to remember that we're going to calculate a ratio. So as is always true, you take your unknown signal you subtract from it your intercept. Then you divide it by your slope. Now what that's going to give you is your unknown ratio. And to back out what the, the weight percent copper is, you need to multiply that by the 2.3, which is the gold. And this is weight, weight percent copper. And this is also, let me clean that up. So the units that you end up getting out here are going to be really defined by the units that you sort of define yourself for both of your axes. So there we go. That's the final error. And as you can see, uh, if you look at this particular data set, we got a 0.993 R squared, and up here we had a 0.917. And that's really the power of internal standards, is they're going to really wipe out some of that, those errors, and we're going to get much, much smaller errors. Now, if you wanted to turn this into a 95% confidence limit, remember the degrees of freedom you look up is given by n minus 2 which in this case would be 3. And if you want it for a 95% confidence limit, you end up with a t is equal to 3.182. And so your final error bar is going to be this number times 3.182. And your actual measurement is 0.16. So it's a pretty decent error. And given how messed up this data was to start with, the internal standards clearly helped. Okay, so let's do two method of standard addition problems. So in these problems, one of the things you first have to do is calculate how to make your calibration standards. I haven't talked a lot about how to do that, but in this question you're asked to first calculate the amount of a standard to add to each volumetric before diluting to the mark. So this is just kind of some practice in figuring out dilutions in an Excel, Excel sheet. So you want your target cobalts to span from 0 to 10 ppm as shown here. So to calculate first the milligrams of cobalt that are present in each of your volume metrics, you're going to multiply your PPM number, which remember has units of milligrams per liter, times however many liters you had, which in this case was 0 0.050. So there you go. That's how many milligrams you need of each of cobalt in each of these um, containers. Now, to get the volume of standard, you want to know how much of a 1,000 ppm standard do I have to add to get that many milligrams? Well, if I have a 1,000 ppm, that's migs per liter. So if I want, well, zero is easy. You're going to take the milligrams you have and you're going to divide them by 1,000. 
and that's going to tell you the answer in liters. But you're going to want to work, I'm guessing, in milli, uh, microliters. And the reason is that you have such a concentrated standard that you're not going to want to work in mils or liters because you'd have wouldn't right, be the right unit. So you're going to be adding microliters of material, and you can definitely get, for example, pipette men that have pretty good precision down to about 100 microliters. And that's also important because you don't want your standard to add that much volume. Remember, the whole point of doing the method of standard additions is you want your calibration matrix to be equal to your sample matrix. And so if there's too much um, standard added, it dilutes the matrix. So typically, when you make the method of standard additions, you're going to be working with very, very small volumes of standard addition material so that you don't add too much plain water to those um, volumetrics. Remember, at the end of the day, you're going to be adding sample to dilute these things up to 50 mils. And 100 microliters isn't going to be much of uh, pure water on top of 50 milliliters of sample. OK, now we get into the data set. Um, so we want to know the concentration of cobalt in the unknown. So remember that this data, let's go ahead and plot it out. If you take a look at it, is interesting because there is an offset. So because our zero standard had some amount of cobalt in it, there's a strong offset. And really what you're doing in the method of standard additions is you're deriving the line from the added cobalt. So this line and the slope of that line is going to give us our instrument response function. Then you're going to apply that to figuring out, OK, if I had a signal of 51, how much cobalt must have been present? So let's go ahead and do that. So the slope of the line and then we have the intercept. Okay. Now, to get a, the amount of concentration in this unknown, it's just going to be the signal 51 up here divided by the instrument response function. And voila, that's way, way, way too many digits. So I'll go ahead and round it up. That's a reasonable number to include at this stage. So that's how much cobalt we had and our zero added sample. Now, to get the error on this estimate is an interesting prospect because we're going to use a slightly different formula than the one that I gave in lecture on lecture. I believe it was lecture three or four. It's called the extrapolated. Um, and when you have a data point that's at the very edge of your linear regression, you're not interpolating, you're extrapolating. And what that basically means is you're going to have a larger kind of error associated with it. So you use a slightly modified version of the SX0 function called the SXE statistic. And it's got a lot of the same components, though. So we have to get our STEYX. So the second term is now really wh where the changes are, because you're going to just take the average of all of the y values. So you're not going to take the difference between your the y you're interested in. You're just going to take the average shown here, and you're going to square it, divided by the slope squared times SXX times, now we don't have a 1 plus 1 over n, we just get 1 over n, which is 4, plus our second term, which is pretty big, because this is not such a great regression, and then all of that. So that's our, that's our SXE term. And remember, if we want to turn it into an actual error, and that's going to have units of PPM. So to get it into a confidence limit, now what's really hurting us in this calibration is we only took four data points, which is really probably not enough. And so when you look up the degrees of freedom of 2, remember you look up n minus 2 for the degrees of freedom, you end up with a very, very large um, t value of 4.303. So it's this number times 4.303. And that's a fairly large number, again, in this case, really caused by the fact that we only have four data points.